Michigan Justice Chronicles with Dan Guerin takes you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes of criminal defense law, uncovering the strategies, stories, and stakes that define justice in Michigan. Welcome everyone to Michigan Justice Chronicles with Dan Guerin. I'm Tracy Murda and I'm excited to meet with Dan today and dive into a discussion about firearm offenses and defenses in Michigan. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tracy. Glad to be here. Well, I want to sort of jump right in talking about firearm offenses and defenses in Michigan. What sort of recent events that we've probably all seen in the news have caused guns and firearms to be sort of a hot button topic right now? Yeah, good question. I mean, I could do this podcast a year from now, five years from now, or five years ago, and uh, guns, firearms, firearm laws, Second Amendment are always going to be very hot button issues in, in the legal community. And as a ex prosecutor and a defense attorney and a justice attorney, we we're, were sort of see those laws every day up close and personal. And in Michigan, there were a couple of very tragic and very sad. Uh, events that occurred that, in my view, sort of changed the tide a little bit on firearm laws. In November of 2021, a young man, young boy named Ethan Crumbly, went into his school in Oxford, Michigan, and shot and killed several classmates with a gun his parents had purchased for him just a few days before. And that case drew such scorn and such anger and such sadness that it ended up changing some of the laws, which I'm happy to discuss in a minute, here in the state of Michigan. Also, in February of 2023, at my alma mater, Michigan State University, a mentally ill person walked into several classrooms and killed several students at Michigan State University before taking his own life. And that case also brought into the attention the idea of mental illness and the ability to possess guns, which led to some changes in the law. So you have these types of cases here in Michigan. But if you look nationwide, there's always a mass shooting or a gun incident or even an assassination attempt recently on a former president that really brings gun control and gun rights and self-defense and Second Amendment into the forefront of the community discussion. And again, as a justice, criminal justice attorney, we sort of see it on the front lines every day. And I'm happy to talk about the laws, defenses, recent changes in Michigan statutes on firearms as well. Yeah, this is a, a very sensitive and hot button topic, like we said. I'm, I find it so important that we're even having this conversation today. So what is the new Michigan legislation involving guns? So the I mentioned the Crumbly case. I can't say it's an exact direct consequence of it, but pretty darn close. There's now a gun safety law that basically puts liability on people if they don't safeguard and lock up their guns. The Crumbly case, not only did the parents buy their 15-year-old son a gun, but they failed to lock it or secure it, and he was able to easily get it and bring it to school. And at the time, the prosecutor's office couldn't charge them with anything other than manslaughter, which they did and got convictions, the first of their kind. But since that case, Michigan has passed storage laws. Now, if I fail to secure a gun and someone gets it and injures or, God forbid, kills someone else, I am going to be liable for felony offenses. Now, not as serious as the crumbly parents who were charged with manslaughter, but serious nonetheless. So one of the big changes that came in the law was safety laws and liability for failing to take ownership and proper safety of your weapon. The second came out of the Michigan State shooting, which are a series of red flag laws. That's sort of the summary heading of what they are, Tracy, but red flag laws now allow someone, whether it be a family member, a neighbor, a police officer, to petition a court to remove guns from somebody's home or somebody's possession if there's suspicion of mental illness. The shooter at Michigan State, as I mentioned, everyone seemed to know he had some organic mental illnesses, but he was able to have a gun and he brought that gun to campus and ended young lives. If some neighbors had had red flag laws, which are in place now, they could have gone to a court and said, judge, please take away this person's gun. There would have been a hearing and the guns could have been confiscated. So uh, safety laws and red flag laws have directly, in my view, come from those two cases. But there's one other area of law. Now, just very recently in 2024, a law was passed in Michigan. If a person is convicted of domestic violence, even misdemeanor domestic violence, they lose their ability to possess a gun for eight years following their discharge from probation. And while we all instinctively may say, boy, that sounds good and that's really good, for those out there that are big on Second Amendment and gun ownership, there's not always 
positivity out of these laws. Classic example if a woman shoves her husband out of frustration and she's charged with and convicted of domestic violence, which I have seen many times, she would not be able to possess a gun for about 10 years. And for those people that use guns for protection, live alone, feel more comfortable with them, recreational, that seems to be a very harsh penalty. So the third area of law that has changed is this domestic violence conviction, preventing people from possessing guns for eight to 10 years. So we've got these three changes in the laws and as a frontline uh, justice attorney, we're dealing with them every single day and the fallout from all of these new laws. That's an incredibly you know, important topic and discussion. I'm glad we're doing this today. What are the laws in Michigan regarding carrying or concealing a firearm? Well, there, that's a question I get probably more often than not from people who are interested in getting a gun or having a gun. Hey, Dan, wh how can I carry? Wh what do I need to do with this gun? Well, let me sort of generalize it this way. Michigan is a state in which you can generally open carry. Uh, there are places where you cannot, schools and churches and, and other areas, but you can generally open carry. But it's not a state where you can conceal your handgun. And this is sort of a, a crucial fact. So if you go out and buy a gun at your local sporting goods store, you register it, you take all your safety classes, and on the way out of the store, you put that gun in your coat pocket to walk to your car, you are breaking the law. You cannot conceal that weapon unless you have a permit. Now, Michigan uses the acronym of CPL, which is sort of a tongue twisting confusion, which is a concealed pistol license or carry permit, uh, carry permit license. There's a lot of different ways to look at that acronym. But a CPL is something that you affirmatively must go and seek. You go to your county board, essentially, your county of residence, you fill out forms, they do a background check, you must produce evidence that you've taken that handgun safety course. And then if there are no criminal convictions or mental health concerns or other prohibiting factors to getting a permit, the county will issue a permit and that enables someone to conceal that gun. So that, if you have a valid CPL, allows you to put that gun in your pocket, in your waistband, carry it in your car, in the console or in the glove box. But if you do not have that permit and you carry concealed, you are breaking the law. And I can't tell you how many calls we get on average from not only residents of Michigan, but people coming into Michigan, driving through with their gun in the glove box who are suddenly charged with a felony offense. So a CPL is a carry permit and it requires affirmative action to get it. And as we can talk about later, there are many ways you can lose that privilege as well. Actually, I want to sort of dive into that right now. Can you tell us a little bit about self-defense laws in Michigan and especially regarding the use of a firearm? Yeah, we could do hours of a podcast on the topic of self-defense. And I think to summarize it, I will say this. Self-defense in Michigan is divided into two camps or two categories. One is, did the person use deadly force or lethal force? Or if not, did the person use non-deadly or non-lethal force? That's the dividing fork in the road because there are different standards. If you are in a fight and you are losing that fight and you're down on the ground and you're getting beat up and you pull out your handgun and you point it at the other person and say, okay, back off. And that's all you do. Well, you've used non-deadly force. And if you're charged with a crime, say for brandishing, as long as you can show an honest and reasonable belief that you felt the need to pull that weapon, you're probably going to be found not guilty. Now, if you then take that gun and shoot the other person and shoot them in the heart and kill them or maim them, you've used, of course, deadly force. It's a higher standard. You have to show honest and reasonable objective belief that your life essentially was in danger. And so what you have often is prosecutors trying to decide, did someone act in self-defense or are we going to charge it and make that person prove self-defense, which is typically what happens. Now, we have a series of laws in Michigan. We have a basically a no retreat requirement. Some states require you to retreat from danger. Michigan does not. It's basically a stand your ground type of state. There's also rules that protect your home, castle doctrine, and so forth. So in short, if you pull a gun on somebody, use a gun on somebody, the question is, was it deadly or non-deadly force? Did you have an honest and reasonable belief that you needed to prevent either serious bodily harm or death or injury, or that you had a reasonable belief that that was a necessary act. So lots of self-defense claims come from gun use. The most serious, obviously, are charges of murder and so forth. And 
These all are sort of gray area cases, Tracy, where there's never going to be black and white as to whether that was valid self-defense, which is why so many of them end up going to trial. Dan, why would you say it's so critical that anyone who is facing criminal charges for a firearm related offense hire your firm on as early as possible in their case? Yeah, there's no question. And as we can talk about, the grand majority of felony or excuse me, of, of firearm offenses in Michigan are indeed felonies and some are even federal offenses. So the grand majority, call it 90 percent of gun cases. If you find yourself in the criminal system, you're finding yourself facing down some significant prison time. So right there, that should tell you you need a good advocate. You need a good attorney with experience in these types of cases that's not going to uh, sell you out and that's not an experience and that knows how to navigate the criminal justice system. Obviously, we just talked about self-defense. If you pulled a gun and you've injured or, or killed someone, you're going to need top-notch legal defense so that you don't spend the rest of your life in prison for an act that you believe was necessary to defend yourself. And then, as we sort of talked about a little bit before, there's a lot of ways you could lose your privileges to ever have a gun again. So if you're serious about gun ownership, you're serious about Second Amendment rights, you need to have an attorney protect those rights because if you plead to some offense and lose your privileges or you're convicted of even some misdemeanor offenses and you have to wait a number of years and you're an avid hunter, you're recreational, it's going to be very upsetting to you. So there's no doubt from the most serious self-defense homicide uh, gun cases down to even domestic violence cases or PPOs, it's a great idea to have a, a skilled defense attorney on your side. So Dan, what are the common criminal offenses involving firearms in Michigan? Yeah, so probably the most common is another acronym. Here we go, CCW, uh, which stands for carrying a concealed weapon. And that doesn't sound like it should be a violation of the law, but it is. In my view, it should be unlawful carrying a concealed weapon, put a U in front of it. But that is by far the most common uh, crime. So we talked about what you need to do to get a permit and how many people don't. And you can imagine how many people get charged with CCW. So someone's driving down the road. They've got their new gun or their gun they've had for many years. It's in their glove box. They get pulled over for speeding. And as they're required to do, they say, officer, I have a gun in the glove box. And suddenly they have handcuffs on. They're brought to jail and they're charged with a five year felony. And it's a felony that's very tough to defend because it basically is what we call strict liability. You don't have a permit. You conceal that gun. You're breaking the law and it's a felony. So by far and away, that is the most common firearm or gun offense in the state of Michigan. Then you start to get into other offenses, a lot of road rage cases, you know, anger out on the roads often bubbles over into someone pulling out their gun, pointing their gun, brandishing. So you see a lot of brandishing charges, felonious assault charges. Sometimes it even ends up in, in serious shooting cases, but a lot of road rage gun cases uh, in the justice system. Then you see cases like discharge, people shooting their guns in their backyard or up in the air, just foolish acts that end up getting them charged with offenses that are not harming people or, or assaulting people, but are still very careless and very reckless and there's a host of misdemeanor and felony charges to encompass that conduct. Then you have felon in possession. We talked about how if you have a domestic violence conviction, you can't possess. Well, if you're convicted of a felony in Michigan, you cannot possess a weapon for a number of years. And if you don't restore your rights, you can never possess. And so you get a lot of people who had a conviction years ago. They go out and get a gun or they possess a gun and they're charged with a felon in possession. And then you have felony firearm, probably the most serious, which is any use of a firearm during any commission of a felony, and it's a mandatory two years in prison. So if you get in a fight and you pull out that gun and you're convicted, then you're going to get a mandatory two years in prison, no matter whether you have a criminal history or not. It's what basically the justice system called a gun sweetener, and it is obviously very serious to think you're doing prison time if you use a gun in any form during any felony. And then, of course, we talked a little bit about self-defense and, and this type of crime, but you have guns used in shootings and self-defense type cases. So these are the, the wide range with the grand majority of them falling in that category of carrying a concealed weapon unlawfully. What about the loss of rights to own or possess firearms laws in Michigan? You talk about people who have anger or those calls we get from someone who calls up and says, what do you mean they can take my gun or they took my gun? And, and I often have to say, yeah, that's what the law says. So how do you lose your right? Well, we talked a little bit about domestic violence convictions. Someone goes into court, they have a fight with their spouse, they decide they're just going to plead guilty and get some probation, and then they're told for eight to 10 years they can't possess. So that's 
one way is a domestic violence conviction, a felony conviction, which we just talked about. Any felony is going to disqualify someone for three to five years. Bond conditions, you get charged with a drunk driving or a retail fraud or an embezzlement. Nine out of 10 times, judges in Michigan will say, you cannot possess a gun while this case is progressing. So even if you're not guilty yet, or your case is progressing, you can't possess a gun while on bond and then on probation. Even if you're on probation for a misdemeanor, you're told you can't possess a weapon. So these are the different ways in which someone might lose their ability to possess. Sometimes it's permanent. You might lose your carry permit if you're convicted of certain offenses. Let's say you get a personal protection order against you. We see a lot of these neighbor disputes where someone gets a protection order against a neighbor. You cannot have a weapon during the period of protection. So various ways someone can lose their privileges to have a firearm, various ways people can be suspended from having a firearm. And then there are a lot of ways that people have to petition the courts to get back their rights after a certain conduct. So I say to those people who are angry and have lost their rights, they should have talked to an experienced attorney before they made decisions, and maybe they would still have those Second Amendment rights. Well, Dan, this has been a true pleasure. What an interesting topic that we've talked about today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Michigan Justice Chronicles with attorney Dan Guerin. For more information or to connect with Dan, you can visit glgmichigan.com or find him on social media. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a review in the comments. Dan, thank you so much. Thanks, Tracy. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a review in the comments.